Jason Brown was soaking wet, cold and mad as hell. He turned his collar up, trying to keep the rain from running down his back as he trudged across the muddy field. He was already so wet that he couldn't tell if it made any difference. After a minute, he decided it didn't, if anything, the collar seemed to act as a funnel. He was too cold and wet to turn it back down. His car had slid off the road a few miles back in the heavy rain. After ten minutes of trying to get his car out of the ditch, he gave up and began walking back across a muddy field to a farmhouse he passed a few minutes earlier. The soft muddy field made every step a question of endurance. By the time he reached the porch, his anger had been reduced to being just miserable and wet and cold and tired. He knocked on the door of the house then slumped against the doorframe, exhausted from his efforts to just reach the shelter of the large covered porch. He heard faint sounds of movement behind the door. A moment later, a handsome young blonde-haired man opened the door. Jason barely noticed that he was barefoot, wearing a pair of jeans and t-shirt as if he had been in the process of changing his clothing when Jason knocked on the door. I'm sorry to bother you, Jason began, but my car went off the road and I need a telephone. Before the young man could speak, the world started to turn black and Jason fell soundlessly to the wooden porch. The young man quickly bent over Jason, turned his head back toward the open door and yelled, Sam, come here. I need your help. A moment later, an attractive young woman, also blonde and about the same age as the man, appeared at the door. She looked down at the still form of Jason. Let's get him inside and dried off before he catches pneumonia, she said. Jason awoke slowly, unsure where he was. Opening his eyes, he discovered he was laying on a couch in a living room he had never been in before. His senses slowly came back and he realized that he was warm, dry, wrapped in a blanket and totally naked. A fire was crackling cheerfully in a large stone-faced fireplace, adding additional welcome warmth. Sitting in an easy chair facing the couch was the young man Jason vaguely remembered opening the door. He was fully clothed and reading a newspaper as though nothing had happened. Excuse me, Jason began weakly. The man looked over the top of the newspaper at Jason and smiled. You're awake. Good. You had us worried there for a while. You were in pretty bad shape when we brought you in. Thank you, Jason said sincerely. He sat up, keeping the blanket wrapped tightly around his body. Where are my clothes? Saw, uh, Mary has thrown everything in the wash. Wash? We could have just thrown them in the dryer, but they were pretty muddy. They should be done in a couple of hours, the man explained. Jason nodded. I suppose I should introduce myself, seeing as how I'm seen to be stark naked under this blanket, Jason stuck out his hand cautiously. My name is Jason Brown. Sam Peterson, the young man said shaking Jason's hand firmly. My, uh, wife's name is Mary. Now that we've got the formalities over with, how about some hot homemade soup? I don't want to put you to any bother, Jason automatically replied. A good hot steaming bowl of soup is exactly what he needed right at the moment. Not a problem, Mary is warming some up right now. Sam had no sooner spoke when an attractive woman, Mary, entered the room with a large bowl of soup. Setting it down on the coffee table in front of Jason, she smiled and asked how he was feeling. Much better, Jason replied. Mary sat down in the easy chair next to her husband. Keeping her knees tightly together, she folded his hands in her lap. She sat quietly for a moment, watching Jason consume spoonful after spoonful of the steaming soup. Jason glanced up, realizing he was being watched. Delicious, he said, thinking that was what Mary was waiting for him to say. She smiled. What were you doing out on a night like this? Sam asked breaking the silence. I have an appointment tomorrow afternoon in Clarksburg. Clarksburg, that's over 200 miles from here. Mary exclaimed. Sam chuckled sympathetically. Don't think you're going to make it. Probably not, Jason sighed. He paused to listen to the heavy rain hitting the roof of the farmhouse. Wow, listen to that. Sam nodded then shook his head. News said that this was the worst storm in twenty years. He had no sooner completed his statement when the lights flickered then went out. 
Everyone sat staring at one another for a moment in the light from the fireplace. I'll go check the fuses, Mary said, suddenly standing. She walked into the kitchen and obviously into some object she had not expected to find. Jason thought he heard a sharp profanity from the direction of the kitchen. Mary's voice came from the darkened kitchen. Mary, uh, I mean, Sam. Where in the world did you hide the flashlight and the lanterns? Sam looked apologetic, rose and went into the kitchen. Jason heard whispering in the kitchen as Sam and Mary had a quiet discussion. A few minutes later, Mary came back into the living room, carrying a couple of pressurized kerosene lanterns. Both lamps looked well used and, in spite of their low-tech technology, produced sufficient light to see by. Obviously, power outages were fairly common in the country. Mary tossed another log on the fire and sat down. Sam should be right back, she said. Would you care for some more soup, while it's still hot? Jason shook his head no. Moments later Sam returned to the living room, a look of resignation on his face. Well, just as I suspected, it's not the fuses. Looks like the storm knocked out the power. He stepped over to a telephone sitting on an end table, picked it up and listened for a second. Phones too. If both of those are out, that means that the bridge is probably out as well. Looks like no one is going anywhere soon. Has all the earmarks of a bad horror movie, doesn't it? Jason laughed. Or one of those corny old The Salesman and The Farmer's Beautify Young Daughter jokes. Sam laughed as Mary looked amused. As a matter of fact, we do have a beautiful young daughter, but she's at Stanford at the moment. Robin's a junior. She's majoring in business administration, Sam said proudly. Your daughter's a junior at Stanford? Jason asked in surprise. He looked at the young couple, neither appeared to be old enough to have a child in high school, let alone college. We're older than we look, Mary said casually, sensing Jason's confusion. Sam glanced at Mary, much older, he added, and in case you're wondering, Robin is 22 years old and our biological child. Confused, Jason looked at the young couple again. Impossible, neither looked more than 25 or 6, 27 tops. Ah, uh, if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? Jason asked. I'm 52 and my wife's 49. That statement, as odd as it sounded coming from either of the young couples sitting before him was not as strange as it had been coming from Mary herself. Jason looked at Mary, you mean, you're 49 and your husband is 52? Sam grinned broadly, nope, he's got it right. My husband is the older of the two of us. Jason looked back and forth between the two, a blank look on his face. Mary paused before answering, just to give the moment a sense of drama. We're not who we seem to be, she said smiling. Jason looked back and forth between his hosts, the blank look on his face looking even blanker. This is a joke, right? Mary motioned to Sam, Honey, why don't you get the photo albums? I think it's time we showed our guests our family pictures. Sam disappeared into another room with the flashlight. A few minutes later, he returned with a couple of photo albums. He handed Jason one as he sat down. Mary moved to the couch and sat beside Jason, obviously to provide narration to the photos. The first few pages were devoted to what was obviously a wedding. Jason looked up in surprise. The couple in the pictures looked nothing like the couple that were seated next to him. The man was obviously tall, perhaps six foot six, or near enough, and being pole skinny. The woman, on the other hand, was short, barely over five foot and a little on the plump side. Jason looked up at Mary, a question in his eyes. Yes, those are pictures of our wedding, Mary said. We just celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary last month, Sam added. Jason studied the pictures again then did the same with the young couple. Sam and Mary, or at least the people who claimed to be the same people in the pictures, were nearly the same height at about five foot eight. Mary had a figure that most women would die for, and Sam had a well-proportioned lean and muscular build, a man in his prime. The next few pages in the album showed the couple in various locations, obviously very happy. Those were taken on our honeymoon, Sam added. Jason flipped through a few more pages, more pictures of the couple in the wedding pictures. 
sometimes one or the other, sometimes both, but the same two throughout the album. The last few pages, a very pregnant Mary was almost the sole subject of the snapshots. Mary wordlessly handed him the other album. The first few pages showed the couple with their new baby. After that the pictures chronicled the growth of their only child. It wasn't until the child's fourth or fifth birthday picture did Jason realize what he was seeing. Their child, the daughter they had said was enrolled in Stanford, was a boy. Other than aging there was nothing remarkable in the rest of the pictures until the child appeared to be about twelve. Suddenly, there was a girl in the pictures. There became a pattern after that, there would be a few pictures of the young girl, then a couple of the boy, then back to the girl again. The picture series that astonished Jason the most appeared to have been taken during one summer. A large number of the pictures showed a tall, lean young man usually wearing a pair of bib overalls or jeans without a shirt. In some, however, it appeared that the boy was wearing a well-filled bikini top under his overalls. If Jason hadn't seen the proof with his very eyes, he would have suspected that his hosts were playing some sort of trick on him. The pictures were too convincing for that however. He flipped a few more pages then noticed something really odd. In one picture showing Sam and Mary, they were both the same height and looked much as they did now. Sam took the album from Jason's unresisting fingers. The rest of our pictures are on videotape. Sorry we can't show them because of the power, there are some very interesting scenes that you might find interesting. Mary, Mary said, I think it's time we showed Jason here, what all this is about. Why don't you get the medallion? Sam left the room. Jason watched the young man leave, then turned to Mary. Would you care to tell me what's going on, here? I really should wait until Mary returns, before I say anything, Mary said, but, she always said I could never keep a secret. He's worse than any of the schoolgirls I ran with, and they were terrible, Sam laughed as he returned to the living room. Mary gave Sam a dirty look. Have you ever heard of the medallion of Zolo? Sam continued. Jason shook his head. Well, legend has it that the medallion was made by a witch doctor in Bronze Age Africa. The first recorded mention of it was in a diary of a missionary in 1875. A witch doctor? Jason chuckled. Mary, why don't you tell him the most interesting part, Sam suggested. Mary glanced at her husband, a slightly annoyed look on her face. The medallion has magical powers. Jason laughed. No, really. It has the ability to change people physically. All you have to do is to put the medallion on, touch a piece of clothing to it and you will change into the person the clothing belongs to. Or if you touch something that has never been worn before, you will change into what you would have been if you had been born into that body. Sam added. Jason looked blank at the last statement. You saw the pictures, right? How tall do you think Sam was when we got married? I don't know. Six foot six? Close. I was six foot five and weighed 150 pounds, Mary interjected. And I was five one and weighed about the same, Sam smiled. Mary had always hated being short, and I didn't much care for being so tall and scrawny. Once we found out what the medallion would do, we started to experiment with it. Mary bought some women's jeans that were too long, and two sizes too small. I bought some pants and a shirt that were too short but otherwise my same size. We ended up looking pretty much the way we do now. Once we were satisfied how we looked, we used the medallion to become younger. That was a little trickier, but well worth the effort, Sam interjected. But you keep saying that you're each other. How did that happen? Jason asked if someone touches the medallion while you're wearing it, you will both change into each other. I see, Jason said slowly. But why? I mean, what's the point? Variety is the spice of life, Sam laughed. Seriously, after Robin was born, we discovered that I liked working in the fields more than being a housewife and a mother. And I loved being a girl. It's interesting, Mary added with a little laugh. But we do change back every so often. As Mary said, variety is the spice of life. Jason looked amazed, but he was still obviously doubtful. Sam laughed. I can see he doesn't believe us, honey. 
Perhaps a demonstration is in order, Mary suggested with a smile. Perhaps. Sam agreed, I sure wish we could change ourselves, but it hasn't been long enough. Has to be at least twelve hours between changes, you see. The couple looked expectantly at Jason. He could almost read their minds, they wanted to have him try the medallion on himself. We'll have to get something for him to wear anyway. There's no way we could dry his clothing tonight, maybe not even tomorrow either with the power out. On the other hand, we can't have Jason here running around naked, can we? Honey, there's a box in the spare bedroom that has some old clothes in it that Jason here can wear. Why don't you get them and whatever else you think he might need for tonight? I really don't think I could wear anything of yours, Jason protested. Jason was both taller and heavier than either Sam or Mary. We kind of thought that we would use the medallion so that you would fit the clothing, rather than the other way around. You're going to turn me into one of you? Jason asked, looking from Sam to Mary, then back again. Well, he was always one for a good joke, and this was turning out to be a doozy. Well, no. I think that would be a little awkward, Sam replied looking thoughtful. He handed Jason the medallion. Here, just slip it over your head. Jason hesitated for a moment. He studied the medallion for a second. The first thought that crossed his mind was that it was very old and awfully cheap looking. As bizarre as the conversation had been, he didn't really think it was anything more than an elaborate joke. Well, he was the proverbial captive guest. He had no clothing, at least none that was dry and on him, it was getting late and he was tired. If Sam and Mary had gone through all this just to say it was all a big joke, then why not play the straight man? Jason slipped the medallion over his head. Mary came into the room a moment later, carrying a small bundle of clothing. Noticing the medallion around Jason's neck, Mary walked to the couch and sat down beside him. Without a word, she took the garment on the top of the pile and brushed it against the medallion. After briefly touching the bronze disc, she replaced the garment on the couch beside her, all in one continuous movement. It had been too quickly for Jason to see much of the garment, other than it looked like a pair of sweatpants. For a moment or two, Jason didn't feel a bit different. His body began to tingle as though an enormous vibrator had been strapped to his back. His body began to shrink, slowly at first then more rapidly until he was swimming in the blanket he was wrapped in. Jason stood up, shocked by the sensations running through his body. The blanket held loosely around his narrow shoulders fell away, exposing his naked body. He looked down and nearly fainted. Not believing what his eyes were telling him he grabbed for his groin. Too late, his penis and testicles had already disappeared inside of his now girlish groin. No, he moaned in a voice that rapidly rose to a young girl's alto. Frozen in shock, he stared again at his groin. He shivered, partly from the cold, but mostly because of the impossible transformation that he had just gone through. Here, honey, you'd better put some clothing on, Mary said forcing a garment into his now much small hands. Jason looked at the garment uncomprehending for a moment, before he realized that he had just been handed a pair of panties. Girls' pink cotton panties. He at Mary, realizing for the first time that he had to look upward to see her face. He was shorter than they were now. He mechanically pulled the panties up to his waist. Mary handed him something that looked a little like an undershirt, only was made of much finer cotton. He pulled the undershirt over his head, realizing only at that moment that he had hair hanging well below his shoulder blades. He pulled it out from between the undershirt and his back. Grasping a hank of hair, he pulled it around to look at it. Blonde! His heart that had been racing began to slow down once his slender body was partially covered. The sigh that escaped involuntary from his delicate lips sounded more like a sob than a sigh as he pulled the sweatpants on. It was then, once he could no longer clearly see the panties and the conspicuous lack of male genitalia, that the question he had been meaning to ask came to mind. Stealing himself to ask the question, Jason looked at Mary. Whose clothing is this? They were Robin's. We got them right after the first time she changed into a girl. She was about what, nine or ten then, right honey? Mary asked Sam. About that, he confirmed. I had forgotten how cute she was at that age. 
You turned me into a little girl, Jason said accusingly. It didn't dawn on him until much later that he was identical to the young girl in some of the pictures. Relax, it's only for 12 hours. By then the power will be back on, your regular clothing will be clean and dry, and you can change back and be on your way. Consider this a rare privilege. It's not many men that have the opportunity to see for themselves what it's like being a girl. Mary smiled at the comment. Not unless they're trapped in the twilight zone. Jason's sarcasm barely concealed his true feelings about his unwilling transformation. Mary handed Jason the sweatshirt. Unlike the almost unisex-looking sweatpants, it had a kitten printed on the front and was obviously a girl's. Jason put on the sweatshirt and a pair of heavy cotton socks Mary had given him. Now wearing warm clothing again, Jason folded the blanket up and sat down on the couch. After a moment, he tucked his legs comfortably under his seat. I'm sorry, it was the best we could do, given the circumstances. If you had to change me to fit into some clothing, why didn't you use something of yours? I don't want to be either a child or a girl. I told you that it would have been a little awkward to change you into one of us. Robin seemed to be the only logical answer at the time. Sam looked serious for a moment. We did consider using some of the clothing that Robin had left behind when she went off to Stanford, but decided against it. Why, not? Well, Mary began apologetically, most of what she left was summer clothing. Almost worse than no clothing at all in this weather. That and… that and the fact that we didn't think you would really like being an instant 36C. Or risk having a period, Sam concluded for Mary. As you are now, a young girl, you won't have that problem to worry about. I know Robin didn't like it when she accidentally discovered the secret of the medallion. That's why we bought her some younger clothing, so she could become acclimated to the changes easier. Jason looked dumbfounded for a moment, then laughed in his little girl's voice. I suppose I would have been a little freaked out at that, he admitted. Not to mention feeling a little awkward. More awkward than you realize, Mary smiled, if we changed you into a more mature Robin, and you started having a period, you would have been stuck like that until it was over. If you became pregnant, or changed with someone who was pregnant, you'd have to go full term. Jason shuddered. If he had to be a girl, being a nine-year-old for a few hours wasn't that bad, given the alternative. Jason fell silent, watching the flames on the fire. Sam and Mary watched him closely, waiting for his enviable outburst to begin again. Finally, after what seemed hours, but was only a few minutes, Jason sighed. Only twelve hours, huh? Most of which you'll probably sleep through, Sam confirmed. Speaking of which, it's close to my bedtime, Mary announced. She stood up, yawning, stretched once, then held out her hand to Jason. Why don't you turn in too? Come on. I'll show you where the bathroom is and where you can sleep tonight. The novel experience of going to the bathroom as a girl fresh in his mind, Jason crawled into the bed Mary had shown him. He paused just long enough to look at himself in the mirror over the sink. Staring back at him was a young girl, very blonde, with blue eyes and a cute button nose. He looked like a younger version of the pictures of the Peterson girl, Robin. Tired from his ordeal walking to the farmhouse and the stress of suddenly finding himself a young girl, Jason didn't have time to explore his body, much beyond gingerly cupping his groin with his hand over his panties. Marveling at the smooth flat surface, Jason yawned twice then fell asleep. Jason felt a hand on his shoulder, roughly shaking him. Jason, Jason, wake up! Jason sat up in the warm bed, rubbing sleep from his eyes. It was still dark in the room. What's that matter? Get up quickly, Mary said. The creek is flooding. It will be in the house in another hour, maybe even less. Now wide awake, Jason threw the covers back and leaped out of the bed. He had never been one to wake up quickly, but this was better than any alarm clock he had ever owned. He grabbed the sweatpants he had taken off when he had crawled in bed and quickly pulled them back on. Mary was digging through Robin's closet, looking for more clothing for him to wear. Here, put these on, and hurry, Mary said thrusting a pair of tennis shoes and a heavy jacket in Jason's hands. We'll be in the kitchen. Don't take too long, she warned. 
Both the jacket and the shoes were a little too large for Jason's preteen body, but he wasn't going to complain at this stage of the game. When he reached the kitchen, both Sam and Mary were packing food, blankets and jugs of water into cardboard boxes. Mary grabbed one and motioned to Jason to pick up the other. Jason grasped the box and tried to lift it. Expecting to lift the lightly loaded box easily, he was stunned when he found he could barely move it. Grinning to himself, he realized that it wasn't the box that was heavy, it was the lack of strength in his young girl's body. He tried again, successfully this time. Staggering under the weight of the box, he followed Mary out the door. Where are we going? Jason shouted to make himself heard over the wind and the pouring rain. The hay loft in the barn. It's the highest point on the property, Mary shouted back. Neither spoke as they climbed the slight hill the barn had be built on. Mary opened the small door that had been cut into the big slider. She motioned to a table near the door. Put it there, while I get the generator going. It's hooked up to the lights in the barn. It used to provide backup power for the milking machines when we had a small dairy herd, now just the lights are connected to it, she explained, as she ducked through another door. Jason could see a large diesel engine through the doorway. Jason set his box next to Mary's on the table. He glanced around curiously using the flashlight he had taken from the kitchen table. It was a typical barn, post and beam construction, solid and sturdy and mostly empty except for a big tractor and an older pickup with its hood off. The barn looked like it had weathered many storms before. We should be safe here, he thought. The gentle exhaust noise of the big diesel generator and the sudden lights in the barn brought Jason back to the present. Start taking the stuff up to the hayloft, while I go back and help bring some more, Mary commanded as she closed the door to the generator room. Jason nodded. He grabbed the box he had carried before and climbed up to the hayloft. Fortunately, there were stairs, and not a ladder leading up to the loft. Jason began to haul the contents of the two boxes up the stairs. He had just about finished when he heard the small door open, then slam against the larger door it had been cut into. From his vantage point in the loft, Jason could see Mary and Sam place their boxes on the table. Sam returned to the door and closed it, fighting against the strong wind and rain while Mary watched tensely. Sam closed the door and secured it with the throw bolt. With the door shut, the barn, except for the steady drumming of the rain on the sheet metal roof, grew strangely quiet Sam and Mary carried their loads up the stairs to the loft. Sam deposited his load, then returned to the house for more. Well, now all we can do is wait it out, Mary said. Let's get this place fixed up a little. We're going to be here a while. Jason helped Mary sweep a section of the loft clean then spread out piles of hay to lay the sleeping bags on Sam had brought on his second trip back to the house. Why don't you go back to sleep, Jason? There's not much to do or see until it gets light. Mary suggested. Jason nodded, removed Robin's oversized jacket and shoes and crawled into one of the sleeping bags. Within seconds he was sound asleep again. While he slept, Sam and Mary made five more trips, the last through knee-deep water. When Jason awoke again, it was daylight. It was still raining, although not as heavy as the night before. He glanced around and saw that both Mary and Sam's sleeping bags were empty. He slipped out of his and pulled on the oversized tennis shoes he had been given the night before. Sam and Mary were on the main floor of the barn sitting on some bales of hay, drinking coffee out of stainless steel mugs. Neither looked happy as they stared out the open sliding barn door. Jason walked over to where they were sitting and looked out the door himself. He was stunned to see the swollen creek's edge only a few feet from the barn. He glanced quickly toward the house he had found shelter in the night before. Only the very peak of the roof was visible in the swirling brown water. Damn! Jason exclaimed, realizing that the Petersons had probably lost everything they owned to the raging water. It looks like we got out just in time. Sam sighed, first time we've had a flood this bad. I guess we've been lucky. Well, at least everyone's still alive, Mary added. After the water has gone down, we'll have a lot of work to do cleaning up. Thank God, the flood insurance is paid up. Sam turned to Jason. I almost didn't buy any, except that traveling salesman that passed through here last year was very persuasive, Sam explained. Shit, 
Jason exclaimed. What time is it? Sam glanced at his wristwatch. About quarter to nine, why? Jason sat down on the bale of hay between Sam and Mary, a dejected look on his little girl's face. I have, Jason corrected himself, I had a very important meeting in Clarksburg at one. My boss said was a very hot call. Mary looked down at the young girl that sat beside her. Hot call? Hot call, a good prospect for a major sale, Jason said sadly. If I had been able to swing the deal, it would have made me the sales representative with the second highest sales in the Midwest district. You're a salesman? Mary asked. Yeah, Jason agreed ruefully. I haven't been successful lately, but yes, I'm a sales representative. At least, that's what we're called nowadays. Sam chuckled sympathetically, don't think you'll make your meeting. The way my luck's been running lately, I probably wouldn't have made a sale anyway, Jason added bitterly. The trio stared at the swirling muddy water for a moment, each lost in their own thoughts. As the muddy water raced through the farmland, Jason could see his career being washed away with the soil. He'd even managed to lose the company car along with all of his samples. What's the next disaster then could happen, he wondered. He cupped his face in his slender hands and began to cry, something he hadn't done in years. Mary placed her arm around Jason's small shoulders and drew him close to her body. He cried for a few minutes longer then sat up. I feel better now, thanks, Jason said shyly. That's all right Han, everyone needs a hug now and then, Mary said. She smiled, in a few more hours, the time limit will be up and we can change you back. You know, I'll miss having a little girl around the house again, even for the few hours you've been here. You have to admit, it has been interesting, hasn't it? Jason nodded, then glanced at the farmhouse, still underwater. But I thought you need to have my clothing to change me back. Did you bring any with you when we left? No, I was more concerned about other things, like food and drinking water, Mary chuckled. Your clothing should be still safe in the washer, though. We can hang them up in the barn and let the mare dry. Sam looked startled, glanced at Jason then quickly to Mary. Ah, uh, did you think to bring the medallion? He asked his wife. She looked startled, then shook her head. She cast a worried look toward the child sitting beside her. Jason returned the look with one that was bloodless. Jason began to cry again, suddenly realizing the horrible implications. If the medallion was gone, he would be stuck like this forever. Maybe it will be all right, Sam said slowly. I put it in the top dresser drawer, where we always keep it. It will be okay, I'm sure of it. I hope so, Mary replied, as much as I like a little variety, I'm not so sure I want to be you for the rest of my life. What about me? Jason wailed. Sam and Mary just looked at each other blankly. It was something they had never considered. Robin! You made good time, Mary said hugging her daughter six weeks after the disastrous flood. I made good connections. She slowly surveyed the room. Water stains were still visible on the walls and the carpeting was gone as was most of the furniture. I see you got the house cleaned up. Sorry, I wasn't here to help with the heavy stuff. Not much you could have done, honey, Mary replied. Besides you had your finals to complete. That was more important than cleaning out a little mud and water. I'm just glad the two of you got out in time, Robin smiled. Mom, I've never seen you look more radiant. Mary blushed. Thank you, dear, but I'm really your father. Robin laughed. I knew you two were changing with each other every now and then, I just couldn't confirm it. You make a very convincing woman, Dad. Speaking of Mom, where is she? Air, he, anyway. He's gone to town to get some paint and more cleaning supplies. He should be back shortly. Okay, I can at least help with the painting. Did any of my boy clothing survive? If I'm going to be any help, I should change. Mary looked pained for a second. No, sorry. That's okay, I'll run into town tomorrow and buy a pair of jeans, a work shirt and a few other things. You know... I'm almost looking forward to a few weeks of being a boy again. Robin, honey, there's something I have to tell you. We lost the medallion in the flood. 
Robin looked stunned for a moment, then shook her head. Maybe it's better this way, she sighed. I met a wonderful guy at school. And we… Robin trailed off, a faint smile on her lips. She suddenly realized that she wasn't the only one impacted by the loss. Oh my god, dad. If you can't find the medallion, you're stuck as mom for the rest of your life. That's terrible. Mary laughed. Oh, I don't know. Like you I've met a wonderful man who is willing to accept me for what I am. Your mother is now your father, remember. Robin smiled and hugged her new mother. You're sure about this? As sure as I'll ever be. Besides, even if we did still have the medallion, we couldn't change back now anyway, Mary's eyes twinkled, not for another nine months at least. You're pregnant? Robin, knowing the limitations of the medallion, exclaimed. But how? Mary smiled, we had to do something while we waited for the water to go down. Can you think of any better use for a haystack in the middle of the night? Both mother and daughter burst into laughter. They were still laughing when they heard a horn honking. That will be your dad and Brandy. Brandy? Who's Brandy? Robin asked. Mary quickly explained what had happened. So we all agreed that Jason. Brandy will live with us as our second daughter, your younger sister, until she's old enough to be on her own. We'll even send her to college if she's interested. Robin burst into laughter again. What's so funny about that? Mary asked. Wiping tears from her eyes, Robin shook her head. He was a salesman, right? Mary nodded. Remember all those old jokes about the traveling salesman and the farmer's beautiful young daughter? About how the salesman is always trying to get into the daughter's panties. Mary nodded again. Well, now that he's the farmer's daughter, he can get into all the panties he wants to. Mary shook her head at her daughter's attempt at a bad pun. Robin was a very intelligent girl, but she really didn't have the indefinable gift necessary to make a good joke. Yes, dear, very funny. Now, let's go out and you can meet your sister. As they walked out to meet the truck, Mary thought about Robin's comment. It was, all things considered, rather amusing after all, she decided.